All right, I wanted to thank all of you for um, <laughs> waiting to eat lunch and join us today. I am Jonathan King. I lead cloud strategy for Ericsson. And I am joined by an esteemed panel today. We'll talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then, and then adjourn. Um, maybe I can just have uh, each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves, starting with Rahesh there at the end. Hi there, Radesh Balakrishnan, General Manager for OpenStack at Red Hat. I'm Das Kamhout, Senior Principal Engineer at Intel, working on software-defined infrastructure. I'm Roz Roseborough, Senior Analyst at Heavy Reading, covering the Telco Data Center. And Susan James, heading up the product line for NFV Infrastructure at Ericsson. So this is an open panel to talk about uh, current market trends, challenges, and opportunities. And uh, we had an announcement last week that we, uh, Red Hat and Ericsson, had formed a uh, partnership. And I'm curious, Radesh, start with you, get your perspective on the announcement and how it fits in with trends that you're seeing in the marketplace today. So the, the core uh, thinking behind the partnership uh, centers around the fact that in the telco carrier space, there's a burning platform moment. Uh, there is a need to make sure that NFV or network function virtualization as a, uh, as a focus area needs to be made real and into production with truly upstream uh, contribution. So the partnership centers around three areas within that context. One is making sure that there is a 100% open source based NFVI solution that's built on Red Hat OpenStack platform uh, made available by Ericsson. So this is an extension of the Ericsson strategy in this place to become a multi-BIM solution. I'm sure Susan can add more context on that one. The second pillar of that is around SDN solution, given the fact that both uh, Ericsson and Red Hat are partnering around open daylight as a way to drive networking innovation, um, Ericsson are bringing to market a solution that's certified around Red Hat OpenStack platform. And last but not least, the HDS 8000, which is a hyperscale uh, uh, solution which is available in the market, uh, will certify Red Hat Enterprise Linux as well as Red Hat OpenStack platform. So all in all, um, um, an end-to-end -end comprehensive alignment of portfolio across Red Hat and Ericsson to make sure that we are fueling the, um, the communication revolution that's going on. And maybe Susan, building on that, you can, you can similarly add. Um, yes, I think it, it, for us it's very much about providing operators choice. Uh, you know, we don't want to you know, prescribe to them how, how they, they should take their journey and we want to be able to support them in that journey. Uh, and as Radesh said, you know, that's why we've, we have said that we want to take a multi-beam strategy. I think one of the things we see happening in the operators is that, you know, there will be pockets uh, of different parts of the operator taking the journey to, to cloud and to NFV. Uh, and they will make different choices. Uh, and we want to be able to then provide a, a partner that can harmonize those choices in the longer term. And of course, uh, we also see the, the opportunity of partnering with Red Hat beyond just the NFVI space. Uh, as Radesh said, you know, we're doing certification on, on their, our hardware platforms. And I think also it's about being able to support uh, onboarding of, of other applications, not just Ericsson applications. So particularly seeing, you know, RHEL has such a great market penetration when it comes to, to applications, not just in the NFV space, but in the IT space that it becomes critical for us to be a, a, a good infrastructure provider and we need to have support for REL going forward. So I think, you know, it, it's about being open and giving choices. And does Intel sits in a unique position where you, know, you, you partner with a lot of people and you're looking at the roadmap of the industry out there of what's coming. So maybe your perspective on this partnership and what you're seeing in the industry. Yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, uh, NFV and everything that's happening in the comm space is, uh, is where we've been supporting for, for quite some time, um, ever since the start of uh, even Etsy. Uh, Red Hat, we've been partners since, uh, you know, Linux, right? So it's been a little while. Um, and we've also been, you know, massive supporters together of OpenStack and into the Kubernetes space. So, so naturally, from a, from a software perspective, focusing on a, on a market that's, that's growing heavily uh, towards Intel architecture, um, is pretty interesting for us. And obviously with Ericsson, you guys uh, were one of the, the first adopters, of, or the first adopter of our rack scale design. So, so being able to, uh, to bring you know, all these parties together is, is pretty awesome to 
know, go faster. We're always interested in, in things that you know, make the industry move. Excellent. Roz, how do you see this announcement? I mean, do you think of this as big news? Well, I think it's big pr primarily because it's bringing two industry leaders together. Obviously, Red Hat has a history of being, um, you know, being a leader in open source and cloud and, and IT technologies, and Ericsson clearly has the history of, of supporting the telcos. So I think you know, combining those two assets together, I think, makes for a really powerful combination. Awesome. Well, I mean, Susan, building on this, um, you know, does, how does this fit within Ericsson's existing strategy? Do you see this as a change of Ericsson's strategy and evolution? I mean, I see it very much as an evolution of our strategy. I think, you know, when we started this journey some four or five years ago, we, we saw the market playing out in a, in a different way than it actually has. So, of course, as we take you know steps further, uh, we, we evolve our strategy. And I think, as I said before, operators uh, need to have solutions for rail-based workloads. Uh, and and we also see you know these different islands uh, coming forward. So we do see that most operators will have more than one Vim inf infrastructure. Uh, and we want to shift our focus then on how to then manage this multi Vim environment. And how to make you know OpenStack easy to use and consume in a multi-vim context, uh, and that comes from both a management and orchestration perspective, and how you onboard uh, onboard VNFs uh, and different applications, but also from a hardware infrastructure. And I think that that fits really uh, very nicely with our, our HDS 8000 uh, product, where we have the capability of creating virtual pods where we can then allocate dynamically the, kind of the amount of resources required for running those, those uh, different uh, VIMs, if you like. And maybe, um, Ranesh, if you look at the, uh, the landscape beyond NFE, we look at SDN, we look at um, you know, beyond their business models that are coming, you know, how, does, how does Red Hat see the operator space beyond NFE? And what are, what are things that you're thinking about in that space? So, um, if you pull back and look at uh, what's happening in the carrier landscape, clearly on the IT side, there's more maturing of adoption of virtualization that's been ongoing for a while. And then now with NFV in introducing the same sets of technologies with different uh, workload focus, um, I think we are marching towards a unified fabric that's going to be uh, there for both the IT side and the network side on the carrier, uh, uh, from a carrier perspective, right? While the journeys might have started at different points in time. Um, given that, our focus has been making sure that we're not creating a forked solution when it comes to the carrier side, but have um, make OpenStack carrier grade rather than have a carrier grade OpenStack, for example, right? So um, I think that fits in with uh, the, the philosophy or the approach that Susan outlined as well, which is the market dynamics have changed. There was at one point in time a felt need to have certain capabilities which are required for uh, telco specifically, but now the community has come around to realize and innovate to make sure that those capabilities are in OpenStack itself, right? So, so that's kind of the um, uh, long way of saying that we believe 100% upstream first innovation is going to be the model that's going to prove itself out. And we're pretty excited about you know, being in the position to drive that in partnership with Ericsson. No, that's great. And you know, Raz, you've studied this space. You've done recent surveys, I know, on adoption rates and timing. And you know, what, what would you see as, um, and we've been talking about NFE for a number of years now, what would you see as, as the state today? Well, it's funny that you mentioned the research. I just completed the survey for Red Hat. Um, and we found for the first time, we asked this question quite a bit, as you can imagine. And this was the first time where over half of the operators that we surveyed said they were currently executing on their NFE strategy, um, which um, I think is quite noteworthy. And um, similarly, we found that nobody said they didn't need an NFE strategy, and that has happened before. So I think that the question of should we do NFV, that's pretty well decided. I think where we're moving to is now, how do we make this all happen? And so um, I think that's, you know, from an industry standpoint, the more people we have kind of getting their hands dirty, they're starting to expose some of the issues. And of course, the sooner we can expose them, the sooner we can get them fixed. Um, so um, like I said, I'm, I was quite encouraged to see that. And of course, you know, people that are trying to take advantage of this, uh, this trend, that's also very exciting. 
Oh, that's great. And, and Daz, I know you said earlier, you know, have been partnering with Red Hat and, and Ericsson for a long time and really see a big opportunity with carriers around NFE. Maybe just some more perspective from Intel on, on what you're seeing in the market in that space um, in Intel's perspective. Um, yeah, so, so fortunately, you know, it, it, it all is moving forward. So that's, that's you know, fundamentally what we want to see. Um, and also, as, as Radesh noted, um, we're, we're really interested in having you know, one code base that can work across multiple types of workloads. And if you fundamentally actually look at, at NFV versus uh, you know, some other, uh, even a, a big data analytics workload, uh, they're all uh, processes that are doing computing of some sort with different characteristics, but they can all actually run on the same type of, of, of fabric. Um, if I go back a couple years, I, I think I, I sat in a room with Radesh and we, we went over uh, rolling upgrades, uh, you know, all these, these key elements that enterprise needed. And, and actually, if you look at comms it, and telcos, it's, it's the same things. So uh, I think you know, all this work that's been going in uh, for a few years now, and, uh, and by the way, I was, I was building uh, OpenStack Clouds in Diablo days. So, you know, it's, you know, a lot of uh, all that work, I think, is, is really starting to pay off. And so now that the adoption's happening, I think enough of a groundwork's been there that it's not, you know, you need some special OpenStack. It's, you know, you have something that's actually good enough, it's working, and uh, it's just going to get better as we get more laser focused on, you know, NFE workloads plus additional workloads that have, you know, very similar characteristics. If Thanks I could for add dating yourself. <laughs> yeah, <I'm dead. laughs> Absolutely. I was going awesome. to add one thing. Um, you know, you're, you're mentioning uh, Radesh was talking about carrier greatness, mm -hmm. and part of that same survey, uh, we asked people, you know, what was important as they're looking at an NFEI platform, and, and for the first time ever, uh, something besides security was number one, and it was reliability. But what was interesting was that we also asked them how confident are you in the in the existing NFEI platforms to provide all those characteristics. And I, I'm sorry to say they're not particularly confident that the existing platforms can do it. And so that's another reason I think it's important. I think it's interesting that Ericsson and Red Hat are coming together because the telcos want to make sure that the people developing platforms for them really understand what it means to run a network. And I think Ericsson you know, clearly has that kind of heritage. So I think that's going to be important. I think that's going to make some, a lot of them feel much better because you know, you've walked in their shoes and you know what their issues are. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that that sets us up for you know a, a good transition. You know, looking at you know, we have a sense on the state of the industry and why this partnership has come together. And I, I told the panelists beforehand I was going to make a terrible pun, but I couldn't contain myself. <laughs> that uh, we have to talk about containers, um, and uh, that seems to be like that 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 is the next frontier. And we had uh, you know Morantis uh, in the meeting before next door making some some news with directions it's going and taking and I'm curious to get just an open discussion across the panel I don't know maybe uh, Rahesh if you want to go first because we're we're looking to do more in the community space around containers you know we both are highly interested and see it relevant but you know I think there's interesting things for the panel to share and just an open perspective on where where do we think the intersection between NFE and containers is and where, where is it headed Containers, never heard of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, from Red Hat perspective, we are all in on containers. So if you look at Docker uh, as the uh, Docker format, next to Docker the company, Red Hat is the uh, largest contributor. If you look at Kubernetes, next to Google, Red Hat is the largest uh, contributor. And we also have a design from ground up, fully functional container platform in the form of OpenShift container platform that customers uh, such as Pretty-Bon, um, earlier today, uh, they, uh, they were up on stage uh, talking about their big data uh, implementation. Pretty-Bon is one of the largest deployers of our containers on top of uh, OpenStack as well, right? So um, we believe that um, um, being um, in the cockpit, so to say, of driving innovation across OpenStack, KVM, Linux, Kubernetes, and Docker, gives us an amazing opportunity to present choice in terms of you can run physical, you can run virtual, you can run containers. Our job is to make sure that the experience is seamless. So, so that's the um, opportunity that's uh, uniquely uh, in front of Red Hat, and that's how our product strategy is evolving as well. Now when it comes to um, probably the carrier space, we see a little bit of a uh, uh, maybe a lag in terms of readiness to uh, embrace containers per se, uh, more to do with the applications or the NFEs themselves not being ready to get there. That's a fundamental re-architecting 
uh, decision, you know, uh, lots of man hours of work ahead and our opportunity ahead, if you will. Um, but at the same time, from an infrastructure and platform perspective, we are uh, working to make sure that when that ISV momentum does happen, the intersection of OpenStack and containers is ready to operationalize and have a life cycle, uh, supported life cycle around a product. That's great, Susan. I got to give you the mic. I <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to say. Um, I think two weeks ago we were at the uh, SDN OpenFlow uh, World Congress in The Hague, and I think we had a really good demo there that we, we showed where we had a RabbitMQ server running in OpenStack and then spinning up the client in containers. And I think you know there will be more and more of these sorts of examples where you'll actually want to use a combination of both OpenStack and, and containers. And the, and the great thing about that is, of course, when you're using a container, the, the startup time of, of the container is much much uh, shorter than, than it is for, for OpenStack. So, you know, being able to provide networking uh, via SDN uh, and, and um, automating that network becomes really crucial, uh, I would say, going forward. And how we then use containers to be able to, to complement, I would say, existing uh, applications or existing VNFs certainly becomes something that we, we see going forward. Uh, as Radesh said, you know, if you look at the, the bulk of the applications in the NFV space, they very few of them have any containers uh, included at all. But, but certainly we see that as something that, that's coming forward. And then when we're building then the infrastructure around both OpenStack and, and working with SDN, we're making sure that we can manage workloads, again, from a, a, a native perspective, a virtualized, uh, and also a container-based perspective, because applications will tend to dictate what they want to use, rather than operators making a choice or vendors making a choice on this is how we should go forward. So uh, for us to be able to support a, a myriad of, of infrastructure becomes really key going forward. Very good. And Daz, we've talked about containers beyond and, uh, in other meetings and other settings. It's been something we've, Intel's been actively involved in, um, helping uh, really stand up uh, CNCF and contribute early on. So I know you have a lot to say on this topic. I'm curious to get your perspective, maybe not just on the VNF side, but the industry oh, adoption sure. rate of containers. Sure, yeah, totally. So, uh, I mean, containers, have hopefully, all know, have been around for a really long time. Uh, heavily in Linux uh, in 2006, and Docker made it easy. Um, so, so, so basically, uh, we've been sharing a, at least a vision that we, we'd like to see all, all data centers, uh, the core of them being uh, containers, which are basically performance isolated processes. Uh, and in order to, to, and the benefit of that is, uh, is high levels of, of resource utilization, performance optimizations that you can't do uh, natively in a traditional hypervisor-based environment. Uh, if you look at something like Google's Borg, it's, it's built with this, this concept. And uh, if you have an application that actually has the give me entire server construct, you, you run it in a VM. But that, vert, that hypervisor runs in a container. So it's just it's a, it's a constant container world. Then uh, It's nice to see. We actually thought it would take longer uh, for the industry from a technology perspective to get to where we are right now. But it's super encouraging to see uh, the advances in Kubernetes, um, how much movement's going on to it. We love Red Hats you know, all over it. Um, and it's allowing us to do some things that haven't been done before. Now, on the application side, though, obviously, there's, there's tons of different types of apps. Uh, NFE is an interesting space because uh, when they took their uh, initial appliances and moved them to NFE, they actually didn't really re-architect them very much. So um, the reason that they want this high reliability is they didn't take cloud-native concepts, which is resilience, how to design your app in a, in a fashion that, uh, that allows for failure. Um, now, when they see the ability to re-architect containers, it brings a whole new interesting space. Because when you see what the Kubernetes API can do, um, it's pretty powerful when you think about how you run software. Resilience is built into the constructs of the container orchestrator. So, uh, so we're happy to see the, the pace that it's moving. Um, I think there's going to be a widespread of applications, but I think with what both Red Hat and Ericsson are delivering you know, together, you have that full breadth of you know, bare metal, give me a VM, give me a container orchestrated, uh, and then all the way up to you know, even with OpenShift and running across clouds. So. It's a, it's a nice, nice space we're in right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Roz, you've done a study on um, NFE 
maybe a study in the future on containers. Uh, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, we uh, actually did run a survey earlier this year, and we asked the question to the telcos about about containers. And essentially, I don't think any of them said they'd actually deployed containers. Um, and when I spoke with them, it, it was more an issue of we're aware of containers. We know they're going to be a big deal. We're not sure when. We're not sure why. So we're kind of keeping up with it because we know we have to be prepared for it eventually. Um, I think they recognize that it really is going to be the VNF owners having to do that re-architecture. Um, and they will be more the consumers of the containers as opposed to um, as opposed to creating them. So they'll just have to know how to manage them. But it's certainly um, you know, very top of mind for everybody. Susan's uh, tapping my elbow. has more to say here. <laughs> No, I was actually going to turn it around and ask you the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Because I threatened I would do this. So, uh, <laughs> She's called my pun. Um, so I think uh, a couple things to say, I guess, and then re to put my hat back on on the panel piece. I think containers is this next frontier. And actually, a lot of what Daz had said in terms of just the fundamental computer science benefits that come with it, um, but also mindful of the application challenges that Red Hash you, you talk about. You know, there's, I think this is an inevitable future, but how we get there, you know, has to be really well thought out and staged. And I think that that comes with, um, from an Ericsson standpoint, we feel like we've already made investments and have started this journey in certain parts of our business. But what we're very interested to do is have partnerships that can help inform where we go, when we go. Um, and it's really one of the things that has drawn you know, us to, to Intel and to Red Hat is that we can partner across multiple areas of our portfolio uh, and then we can better inform and, and, and um, you know, make decisions on where we take investments. And we view that as part of our job for our customers is that yes, they, we want them to work with Ericsson and they want to work with Ericsson, but part of what they expect when they work with Ericsson is that they're going to get this um, this perspective on where things are and where they're going. And increasingly in the interconnected world we are in, part of that means that we have to form relationships like this so that we can start to work together on you know, the, the lab work, the coding, the development, and actually my next topic, which is, you know, how do we upstream this in, in the right way? You know, you have so many different uh, open source projects out there. Um, and sometimes there's even contention amongst some of them. So, um, and, and then there's also the risk downstream of things uh, happening in forks and how do we work upstream. So hopefully that answers your question, Susan. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think we've talked about the Alliance, we've talked about NFE, um, we've talked about containers, maybe talking more broadly about just um, open, uh, 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 open source organizations and, and upstream activity, and you know we're you're very active in OPNFE, Open Daylight, and um, Red Hat. You, you've mentioned you know it's Red Hat, so you're very active, and Intel's active. Maybe you'd shift the topic to to open source and what what are what is Ericsson doing and driving right now? What are some of the priority communities that we're focused on? So, at least from my perspective, because Ericsson, as you know, is, is driving lots of different things. So, from my perspective, of course, I have a, a high focus on, on OPNV, uh, obviously OpenStack, Open Daylight, Open vSwitch. Uh, we're also getting more heavily involved in FDIO. Uh, we also have the, the Open Complute, Compute Platform uh, and ODCCP. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I haven't been so focused on the hardware ones, being more of a, a software girl myself, but uh, really we have very much embraced the uh, open source community as a, as a development model. I would say that, you know, over the last few years we have very much uh, learnt what that means uh, in transforming to be uh, an open source development model. And certainly what we've learned along the way with OpenStack, we have then uh, transferred directly into our Open Daylight engagements where we, we do take a upstream only approach. So, you know, uh, very much similar to Red Hat. I would say we're in the process of getting there from an OpenStack perspective. Um, as I said, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and, and OpenStack was definitely not uh, ready from a, a characteristics perspective when we started this journey. So we still have a legacy of of capabilities that we've added to OpenStack uh, and we're driving the upstreaming of that content through 
OPNFV uh, as well as directly into OpenStack with partners, you know, working with, with both Intel and Red Hat to, to you know, really make sure that, that, that capabilities are upstreamed because I want to move away from doing any work post-distribution. That has also been our experience around OVS where, you know, we, we took OVS and did improvements. We're now moving away from that model so that we just work directly in, in the upstream. So I think, you know, we've been doing some very good work with Intel around OVS in the last uh, month or so where really made uh, significant imp improvements in performance around OVS. So um, that's the direction that we will go. Uh, you know, we're then using open, uh, OPNV as a way of how to glue these different initiatives together and really make some of those choices. You know, it becomes quite confusing and I think, you know, the whole uh, Mano space right now is a good example of that, uh, where, you know, there is a proliferation of projects ongoing and, and we need to see that, that really come together. Uh, it's, I don't think it's in anyone's in interest to see, you know, too many projects going on, um, and I think that you will see some more harmonisation going in across the networking space as well going forward. And excellent, and I have to have time for this. Excellent. <laughs> and does <laughs> Intel has made substantial investments in open source in in the carrier space and beyond. I mean, it's a core strategic imperative. It looks like maybe you can share your perspective on. Um, open source. Yeah, so pretty much all those projects we're, we're heavily involved with. Uh, even one of my uh, one of my peers, Adrian Hoban, uh, covers uh, a lot of the, the mono work um, from the technical perspective. Um, our goal constantly is uh, is drive as much upstream as possible as quickly as possible uh, because it floats all boats, right? So how to make sure um, whether it's a, a, cl a cloud service provider that chooses to do everything themselves, whether it's somebody that's working closely with Red Hat, we want to make sure that, uh, that everybody that, that is using this technology can move as quickly as possible. Uh, we're actually in a weird state at Intel where sometimes the software actually isn't keeping up with the hardware advances, which is uh, you know, not something that we, we think is beneficial for, for the world. Um, we see some of the, uh, the top players able to utilize those hardware benefits much faster than the rest of the world. And if we, our goal is democratizing uh, how computing happens in the software space. And, uh, and, and really, if you know, only a couple can benefit from this tech because they have deep, deep Linux experience and have their own patches, it's not, we don't see it as necessarily you know, fair for the rest of the world that's trying to uh, you know, push the envelope too. So as fast as we can go upstream, as many you know, core projects as possible, is pretty beneficial, uh, especially now that we have new tech coming like, like 3D Crosspoint, which is going to be a game changer for how people uh, deal with, uh, with, with memory and storage. Um, and then what's happening with silicon photonics. We want to see you know, core projects move as quickly as possible, get organized around something. Right now, there's probably too many container orchestrators out there. Uh, we'd like uh, to see you know, maybe people latch on to one, maybe two but uh, really drive those forward as quickly as possible. There's probably too much strife in the container runtime or formats today, you know, so that's why we care about things like, uh, like OCI and, and driving some standards there. Um, so, so the more that we can you know, lock into a piece of code base, drive it upstream quickly, and keep up with hardware, that'd be a fantastic situation. Yeah, it is. We talk so much about software is eating the world, but you, with 3D Crosspoint, with all the technologies coming at the hardware level, it really, it really is a point where software does need to catch up. Yeah. And Red Hat, you know, you get you have to go to an advanced level because everyone knows it's Red Hat, it's open source. So, you know, how do how do you um, get the benefits of this upstream first mentality, but still maintain the velocity of development just to try and catch up to what Daz is talking about? Right. So, first of all, plus one to whatever Susan said and Daz said, right, from a philosophy as well as engagement perspective. To your question about pace of innovation versus sort of the stability, that's what we kind of pride ourselves in being able to parse on a day-to-day -day basis. For us, upstream communities all are about how do we move the needle on the pace of technology innovation. But at the same time, we quickly turn around and then say, we know intimately what does it take to run in production a workload or an infrastructure and to live with it for n number of years. And if you're from Japan, that years might be in two, digit, two digits, if you will, right? So, so that is the product part of it. So by making sure that we're you know, innovating fast, 
we, and in an upstream aligned fashion, we can make sure that the pitfall that Das was talking about can be avoided. In other words, no snowflakes, everybody gets the benefits of democratized innovation that we are driving at a very fast pace. At the same time, from a product perspective, we make sure that we spend an inordinate amount of energy driving quality engineering and having a support life cycle to make sure that customers can live with that, right? So that's the duality that we kind of pride ourselves in being able to do that for the last two decades, and we'll continue to do that. That's great. Well, we've had a far-ranging number of topics. We're approaching our end here. I wanted to see if there were any uh, burning questions from the audience. Um, I know there's probably hunger pains because uh, we're in the lunch hour. Um, and, and, and I have a very important question for Roz if there aren't any questions for the audience. Um, I, don't, I don't see any questions. We'll be up here afterwards um, and sort of joining you all in the movement towards lunch. But my question for, for Roz is like, what, what hat am I wearing? <laughs> for those who don't know, our Cubs are going to the World Series starting tonight. So yeah, so very this is like actually one of the first times I think I've ever worn a baseball hat at an event. <laughs> I mean, I've done t-shirts all the time, but so the, this is the Chicago Cubs uh, baseball hat. So it's the United States thing, baseball, the World Series. And the Cubs have not been to the World Series in 70 years. My mom pointed out that she was three months old the last time they went. Mine too. And they haven't <laughs> won the World Series in 108 years, which is by some reckoning the longest stretch in any sport uh, in modern history. So hence I'm missing the opening game tonight to be here with you. So this hat uh, keeps me comfort. So um, with that, we are a wrap. I want to thank you for joining us in the lunch hour. And please, if you have questions or anything, come up at the end and give our uh, panel a round of applause. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. <laughs>